Today I want to move on through 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and we've been studying through this passage. Last Sunday we were in verses 13 through 15, and before it escapes me and I forget to say something, I also just want to say that last Sunday we had a large group of folks that were visiting. That was our brother Carl Hayes and his family. That He's at a church down in Decatur, Illinois, and they were up here for a family gathering. And I just want to say that they were extremely complimentary and very impressed with the, uh, with the assembly here, with you saints, with the service, and just with everything that they experienced here last week. And so that speaks to you, uh, probably more so than it does to me. And they, they felt welcomed, and I just want you guys to know that that stuff goes appreciated, okay? It doesn't go unnoticed, and it's appreciated and so forth, and uh, I just wanted you to know that. This morning, I just want to review just a few things about verses 13, 14, and 15, and then move on with looking at verses 16 through 18. I do not have a PowerPoint. That's not the right one. I didn't have one this week. I didn't have time for it. So uh, you're not going to have one of those, so I apologize for that. Last week, we were in verse 13. He says, Meats for the belly and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. Now the belly is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God, and God hath raised up the Lord, and will also raise up us by his own power. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of an harlot? God forbid. And then we get into today's verses, which are, What then? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For the two saith he shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Dear Holy Father, we thank you once again this morning for your word. And we pray, Lord, that as we do continue to work our way down through chapter 6 here, that we'll have clarity about these things, acknowledging that these are not the easiest subject, <clears throat> subject matters sometimes to have to talk about. And we do pray that we'll have clarity from your word on them. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Last Sunday in verse 13, we, we observed the following just general points by way of review. We observe the fact that God did not create our bodies for fornication in the participating in illicit sexual relations, but for the Lord. Look at verse 13. It says, Meats for the belly and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Okay? So this is, this is in contrast. What he says about your body being for the Lord and not for fornication is in contrast in that verse to meats being for the belly and the belly for meats. So Paul is not saying, he is not saying that the body is for fornication and fornication for the body. That's the exact opposite of what he's saying. Rather, Paul is saying is that the body, your body is for the Lord and the Lord for your body. And so we spent time last Sunday looking at why God created your body and what he gave you a body for. And we saw that our body is the mechanism through which the life of Christ is lived out today during the dispensation of grace. And that an unsaved person who thinks that their body was created for fornication, what they're essentially doing is they're living in a state of internal psychological turmoil. Okay, And the reason for that is they are seeking to satisfy. Now listen to me. They are seeking to satisfy the needs of their soul and spirit through the fleshly appetite of sex. They're trying to get something fulfilled in them that is a soul need, that is a spirit need, that is a heart need, and they're going about it in the exact wrong way through something that is only physical in its, in its fundamental nature and capacity. Now, I do think there's a spiritual component to a physical relationship between a man and a wife. We'll talk about that later. But that's not what he's talking about in this context. In this context, he's talking about fornication. He's talking about, you know, uh, as we might say in the normal, you know, conversation of, of our day, premarital sexual relationships. Uh, relationships between two people that are not married to each other. And when that happens, they're brought under the power of that fornication, as we've seen. And then in chapter 14, we've seen, and, uh, verse, sorry, not chapter 14, verse 14, and God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise up by, and will also raise us up by his own power. In verse 14, we saw that on the basis of the established fact that the body is for the Lord and the Lord for the body in verse 13, God does two things in verse 14. Number one, has he already raised up the Lord Jesus Christ? Yes. 
And on the basis of the fact that he's already raised up the Lord Jesus Christ, will he also raise you and I up at the appropriate time in the outworking of his plan? Okay? And so that brought us to verse 15, where he says, Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of an harlot? God forbid. So is it fitting at all for members of the body of Christ to join themselves with the members of a harlot? Paul, the answer there is at the end of verse 15 when he says what? God forbid, okay? So Paul is using the principle here of association to awaken the Corinthians out of their carnal slumber, as it were. It is shocking and unbecoming that one who is associated with Christ, one who is a member of his body, would also thereby be associated with an unclean harlot and a member and willful, for, willful participant in that lifestyle. Okay, And so this is the content that Paul is talking about here to us in chapter 6. So with all that in mind, let's start looking at verse 16. Notice, what? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body, for two, saith he, shall be one flesh. Now the first thing I want you to notice about verse 16, again, is that Paul is once again going to ask some questions. So he's once again reverting back to this questioning style and technique of teaching that he's been using. Now, look at verse 15. Verse 15 was also a series of two questions followed by a statement. In verse 15 he said again, Know ye not that your bodies are members of Christ? Question mark. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? Question mark. And then the statement is what? God forbid. In verse 16 you have what? Question mark. Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? Question mark. And then you have the statement that ends verse 16, For the two saith he shall be one flesh. So we, we're, we're into this situation again where Paul is using this, this questioning technique to get the Corinthians to think through the information, to think through the material. Okay. Now, after concluding verse 15, after concluding in verse 15 that it's not fitting, it is not becoming, and it is not proper for a member of Christ to join himself with a harlot, Paul is now going to explain why that's the case in verse 16. Is there any doubt in verse 15 that the answer to his questions is God forbid? There's no doubt about that, right? There's no doubt about the answer. The answer is it is not fitting, it is not proper, it is not becoming for a member of Christ, for a member of the church, the body of Christ, to go and join him or herself unto a harlot, or frankly, with anyone, who is who with and whom they are not married to. And the idea there is, is that fitting, is that proper? And the answer is God forbid in verse 15. What verse 16 is going to do now is begin to tell you why. Why it's not fitting, why it's not proper, and why the answer at the end of verse 15 was God forbid. Absolutely not. Okay? So let's look at verse 16. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? Now, if, if, if you look at that first part of verse 16, the verb is joined. You see in the verse where it says, Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body. Okay? The verb there that is translated is joined is in the present tense. Okay? It's in the present tense. The very fact that it's in the present tense to me is indicating that this type of activity was still going on at Corinth. Okay. Now remember what we talked about last Sunday. Remember that in Corinth was the temple to the great goddess Aphrodite, right? And remember I told you both in the introduction last year and I reminded you of it last Sunday that part of the temple worship, part of the worship of the goddess of Aphrodite was harlotry and prostitution. So the way that you would worship at the temple of Aphrodite is you would go in there and you would basically hire a prostitute and have sex. And that's how you would worship the, goddess, uh, the, the, the Greek goddess Aphrodite. And that's what was going on there in that context. And the fact that Paul says, What know ye not that he, would, that he which is joined to an harlot is one body, indicates that in the present is that type of activity still going on amongst these Corinthian saints at the city of Corinth. The indication to me... 
is that it obviously was, okay? It was an ongoing problem that Paul is dealing with, okay? Now, the believer, the believer who is joined sexually with a harlot, read the verse, know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is what? One body, okay? The believer who is joined sexually with a, har uh, with a harlot is one body with her, according to Paul. Now, I don't think I need to explain to you why that would be the case from an anatomical, physiological standpoint, right? You all are adults in here, and you understand how this happens. The idea that when two people come together, there's a union, right? There's a, there's a joining, there's a uniting that occurs on a physical level, right? Where those two people literally are becoming one in a physical sense as, 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 as the, the, the physical action of sexual activity takes place. And what Paul is saying is that when a member of Christ is joined to a harlot, the result is what? He, he or she is one body with that what? With that harlot, okay? So is there an identification that occurs with that harlot as that physical action takes place, okay? Now, there is the problem, though, right? Therein is the problem. Therein lies the problem. Because in verse 15, Paul says that a believer's body is a member of who? Of Christ. Look at verse 15. Knowing not that your bodies are, are the members of Christ. So as a believer, are you sanctified and set apart under the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you a member of His what? Of His body as we saw yesterday. Okay? So, as a member of the body of Christ, we're part of whose body? Whose body? Part of Christ's body. Go to 1 Corinthians 12 again. Hold your hand there and go to 1 Corinthians 12. First Corinthians 12, verse 12, For as the body is one, and hath many members, if you're saved today, are you a member of that body? Okay. And hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is who? Christ. So, are you a member of the body of Christ? If you are a... So, all of us are members in particular of that body, Paul says later on in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, right? So are all believers the member, are, are all believers in our bodies, are we all the members of Christ? Christ is in us, and we are in Him, right? And we are therefore part of the, part of the body of Christ. Now, the idea then is why, go back to 1 Corinthians 6, why then would you take your body... Why would any believer take their body, which is a member of Christ, and now take that and join it up with what? An harlot. Because when you, take, when you take your body, which is a member of Christ, and you join it to that harlot, you are now one body with that what? With that harlot. Okay. And again, does it, is it proper, fitting, and becoming for that to be the case of a member of, of, a member of Christ to join him or herself with a harlot? No. Okay. So look at verse 16. What then, know ye not, know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? Now look at what he says next. For the two, saith he, shall be what? One flesh. Who are the two? The two would be the believer and what? The harlot, right? So when you take a believer and you take a harlot and they, and they get together in a physical way, the result is they're one flesh with each other. You understand that? Okay, now, the illusion there at the end of verse 16, when he says, for the two saith he shall be one flesh, what is he alluding to there? What he is alluding to is the result of a marriage. What he's alluding to there is the result of a marriage, okay? Go, go with me, if you would, to Genesis chapter 2. Go over to Genesis chapter 2. Folks, all through the Bible, God's definition of marriage is the same. From the first marriage between Adam and Eve in the book of Genesis chapter 2, all the way through to the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, all the way through to the Pauline epistles when, when, when Paul writes to the churches, 
the definition, the fundamental definition of marriage is the same, okay? And if you're going to understand what Paul's talking about in 1 Corinthians 6, you have to understand something about what marriage is and why he would bring this idea up of the two becoming one flesh. Genesis chapter 2, Genesis chapter 2, verse 23. Well, let's, let's back up. <clears throat> verse 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And as he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he what? A woman and brought her unto him. Now, I'm sure Adam, you know, being the, the slick, debonair guy that he is, no doubt looked at Eve and says, you're the only woman in the world for me. That was supposed to be a joke. Because, in fact, she is the only, the, only woman in the world for what? For him, right? Remember what Adam has done up to this point. Adam has gone through an educational process, right? God has caused all the animals to parade by Adam and given Adam the task of what? Naming them. And what does Adam come to realize as he goes through that education process? He comes to realize that in all of the creation of God, he is the only one that is what? Alone. Okay? And so God makes a woman out of man. He takes her out of man and he, and he brings her back to the man. Verse 23. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bone. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, now here it is. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife. Now watch. And they shall be what? One flesh. There's the reference there in 1 Corinthians 6. The result of a marriage is that there's a leaving, so that there can be, there's a leaving and a cleaving, and the result is the production of what? One flesh. A new identity that you have with your spouse. Come with me to Matthew 19. Come over to Matthew 19. Matthew chapter 19, <coughs> look with me at verse 5. You will see here that the definition of marriage, according to the Lord Jesus Christ, is the same as it was in Genesis 2. Matthew chapter 19, verse 5, and said, well, verse 4, And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read? that he which made them from the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be, what? One flesh. Come with me to Ephesians chapter 5. Go over to get Ephesians chapter 5. The definition of marriage according to the Lord Jesus Christ is the same as it was in Genesis 2. And as you're going to see here in a second, it's the same definition that Paul's working with when he writes to the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 5. He says in Ephesians <clears throat> chapter 5, verse 31, he says, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they shall be what? One flesh. Now I want you to think about those three passages. I want you to think about Genesis 3. I want you to think about Matthew 19. I want you to think about Ephesians 5, right? In all those passages, in all those verses, they describe and define marriage according to three fundamental things. Okay? The first one is a leaving. A leaving. Therefore shall a man leave his father and what? Mother, according to, according to the verse. To leave means to loose, to depart from, to leave behind. Okay. Notice just very, very quickly here, who is given the instruction to leave? It says, therefore shall a man leave his what? Father and mother. Now in our culture, it's customary that when two people get married, the, the, the wife takes the last name of who? Of the man, right? Now why do they do that? The reason they're doing that is because they're supposed to be following the leadership that the husband is providing. The husband is to set the standard and set the tone as far as that relationship goes. And he, therefore the instruction is, therefore shall a man leave his what? Father and mother. So the man is to set the, the, the leadership dynamic in that relationship and the woman is going to follow what? 
She's going to follow him in the leaving, right? Now, let me just say this, and I, it's not my intention to talk about this at any length, but there are a lot, a great many of the problems that people have in their marriage is because you haven't left. You got one foot in your marriage, you got another foot at home with mom and dad. Okay? And guess what happens? When conflict arises within that marriage, one or both of you, instead of working it out amongst yourselves, you go run to mommy and daddy. And now mommy and daddy are interjecting into that new marriage relationship, and guess what? That's not going to work. That is not going to work. Okay? So the first aspect of this is that there's a leaving. There's a severing of that old... It's not like they're not your parents anymore, but you are no longer living under their authority. You are no longer living under their jurisdiction, if you will, and you are now entering into a new relationship, which brings you to the second aspect of that definition. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto who? His wife. Notice that it says his wife. Okay? Cleaving means to stick together. You know what happens when you get married? You cleave to a spouse. I use this illustration when I marry people and stuff and do premarital counseling. If I come over here to this wall and I hang wallpaper on that wall, what does that wallpaper do? It sticks to that wall. If that wall has ripples, warts, and bunions, what happens to that wallpaper? That wallpaper has ripples, warts, and what? Bunions. Why? Because you have two individual things. You have the wall, you have the wallpaper, and now you take them together and what? There's a cleaving. There's a new identity that is formed, right? Folks, that's why when, whenever, whenever you have the unfortunate situation that a divorce occurs, a divorce is literally like going over that wall and ripping that wall. What happens when you try to take the wallpaper off the wall? It's a mess. It shreds and it tears and it leaves pieces of each other on each other. Okay? The definition of marriage is that there's a leaving so that there can be a what? A cleaving together as husband and wife, right? Now, what is the outcome of that? What is the outcome of that leaving and that cleaving? The outcome of that is the third thing, and that is the formation of one what? So there's a leave. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they twain, they too, shall be what? One flesh. Now, you know what that's about, folks. That's about the intimate sexual relationship that occurs between a man and his wife. Okay? You understand that? So when these Corinthians, who are members of Christ, are going out and hooking up with a prostitute, what are they doing? They're becoming one flesh with that person without doing what? Without leaving and without what? Cleaving. Now, in case you're going to be confused, I want to show you a few more things about this. According to God's Word, all three of these things need to be present in order, for their, in order for them to equal a marriage. Okay? Jumping, now listen to me, jumping straight to the one flesh issue does not equal what? Does not equal marriage. Go to Exodus 22. Exodus chapter 22, <clears throat> verse 16. It would help if I was in Exodus, not Genesis. Exodus 22. I'm like, I just looked at this verse this morning. I know it says what it says. <clears throat> Verse 16. Now watch this. And if a man entice a maid, what's that? A man is enticing, seducing a maid, a woman that's not what? Married. And if a man entice a maid that is not betrothed, not married, 
and lie with her, he shall surely endow her to be his what? Notice that just lying with her does not make her his what? His wife. If her father utterly refused to give her to him, he shall pay money according to the dowry of virgins. My point here is this. Does simply having a one flesh relationship equal marriage? No. Go with me to John chapter 4. Go with me to John chapter 4. John chapter 4, look at verse 16. John chapter 4, verse 16, this is the Samaritan woman here and so forth. Uh, verse, uh, verse 16, Jesus saith unto her, Go call thy husband and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had, how many husbands? Five. And he whom thou now hast is not thy what? So is she in a physical relationship living with this guy who she's not married to? And does just, does just cohabitating together, does just having a one flesh relationship here equal a marriage? No. Okay. Come, come with me back to Malachi chapter 2. Come back to Malachi chapter 2. So folks, the reason we're going through all this is because you're supposed to be thinking about this stuff in relationship to what Paul's talking about in 1 Corinthians 6. Remember that in 1 Corinthians 6, he's talking about a believer who's a member of Christ coming together and having a sexual relationship with a harlot, right? And the result is that he's one body with her. Is he, does that mean he's married to her? Malachi chapter 2, look at verse 14. Yet ye say, wherefore, because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously, yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy what? Covenant. You know what, a, you know what a, I, don't, I don't mean to sound like a high Calvinist or, a, or a, a, a Roman Catholic this morning, but you know why they call it the covenant of marriage? Why do they call it that? What do you do when you get married to somebody? You swear vows to each other. You are, entering into a, you are entering into a situation where both parties are making promises and swearing vows before, to each other before God and a company of witnesses. Right? So my point is, to simply, to, to say, to, to simply have a sexual relationship with somebody does not equal marriage in your Bible. Marriage is when you have a leaving and a cleaving, and the result of that is what? One flesh. And, and in there somewhere you should, be, you should be exchanging vows. You should be identifying and saying, this is the person that I want to be my wife or my husband. And the way you do that is you, you exchange what? Vows. You, as the scripture says, they become your betrothed. Meaning what? Meaning you've done what? You've married them. Now, the result of that is one flesh. So what happens when you take that one flesh issue and you put that and you put the cart in front of the horse? Go back to 1 Corinthians 6. Now folks, look, I understand that the stuff I'm saying right now is not popular. It's running totally contrary to the culture that is out there. 
But I'm just trying to tell you what God said about it. And you need to understand that there's no difference between the, the state that Paul lived in in the first century when he said these things and the stuff we're facing today. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16. What know ye not that he which is joined to a harlot is one body? For the two saith he shall be one flesh. See, here's the, uh, here's the problem. When one has an intimate physical relationship with someone whom they are not married, to who, with whom they are not married, they are one body with that person, they are one flesh with that person, and they have therefore functioned outside of God's prescribed what? Order. Why, why, th think about this. Why did God, why, what's to come first in the, in the order of God? Marriage or family? See, family is supposed to be the result of a what? Marriage. And what happens in this society when a bunch of people, by and large, run out and start having families before they have marriages? Look around. Look around out there and you tell me what the result is. See, if you go back to Genesis chapter, Genesis chapter 1 through 12, God gives four institutions for the orderly maintenance of humanity on earth. The first one is volition. The second one is marriage. See, you exercise your volition in choosing who you're going to what? Who you're going to marry. And the result of that marriage is going to be the production of a family. And the collective production of families in a society is going to create a nation. Okay? And if, that, and if that nation is going to function the way God intended for the nation to function, the, fam, the, the, marriage is, the, the nation is only going to be as strong as the marriages and the families that comprise the nation. And you wonder why things are going to hell in a handbasket around you. That's why. Because as a societal culture, we bought into the lie of the enemy that none of this stuff matters. What God is telling first century Corinth is that it absolutely what matters. And if you want to reduce the calamity and the stress and the stuff in your own life, pay attention to how God says to do things and do it God's way. Ah, but brother, now you're being harsh. Maybe so. But that's what the Word of God says. Okay? See... You need to hear me on this. Premature physical intimacy clouds one's judgment and brings you under the power of that fornication. When a man and a woman have a physical intimate sexual relationship before they've sworn in vows, and before they have followed God's appropriate prescribed channel, that always and every time clouds the judgment and brings you under the power of what's going on. I've seen too many people in my own life who have made bad terrible, awful decisions about who they should marry because they were physically intimate with somebody before they should have been. And everybody can see it, everybody knows it, and they will not listen, they will not heed anybody's advice because they are brought under the power of what's involved in all that. Now, that being said, look at verse 17. But, contrast, but he that is joined unto the Lord is what? One spirit. So in contrast to the one who is joined to, now listen to me, in contrast to the one who is joined to the harlot, being one body with her in terms of a physical union, the one who is joined unto the Lord is one spirit, and that's a physical union or a spiritual union? Spiritual. Folks, that tells me something about sex. 
Sex is fundamentally a spiritual thing. Now, it's expressed in a physical way, okay? But the, the, the illustration that God is giving the Corinthians here about why that is an inappropriate behavior is because of the relationship that he has with them. Okay? He that is joined unto the Lord is what? One spirit. He that is joined unto the harlot is one what? One body. According to verse 15, or verse 16. Folks, do we have a spiritual union with the Lord Jesus Christ? Yeah. He, we, so much so that we are now his what? His, his temple. His, we are members of his body. Go to 1 Corinthians 12. Verse 13 this time. For by one what? Spirit. Are we all baptized into one body? Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, we have all been made to drink into one what? Spirit. Go to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, verse 27. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on who? Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male or female, for you are all one in who? Christ Jesus. Go to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Look at verse 3. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3. No, in verse 1 he says, therefore, I therefore the prison Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the what? Spirit in the bond of peace. See, since the basic meaning of the word baptized means identification, we observe that the Holy Spirit is the one who identified all believers with Christ in this spiritual union. And when you, go out, when you go out as a believer and you are one flesh with a harlot, you are taking a spiritual identification with Christ and you are joining it to a harlot. Is that appropriate? What does he say? He says, God what? He says, God forbid. Go back to 1 Corinthians 6. <clears throat> Verse 18. Flee fornication. Now why does he tell you to do that? Understand that by the time you get to Verse 18, is he, is he, is he well into his argument now? Okay? So in verse... In verse 13, the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for what? For the body, in verse 13. In verse 15, shall I take the members, uh, you're a member of Christ, should you take the members of Christ and join them unto the harlot? What's the answer? God forbid. What then know ye not, that he which is a harlot, he, he which is joined to a harlot is one body, for the two shall be one flesh? Okay, and then you get to verse 17, 18, and he just flat out says it, flee what? Flee fornication. Now, the verb flee, in verse 18, and I'm going to get real, I'm going to get technical with you just for a second, and I'll explain it in simplistic terms. The verb flee is a present active imperative, which means, which equals a command to get as far away from something as possible, as soon as possible. When he says flee fornication, he's not like, yeah, you know, just... You know, take your time. Whenever, you've, whenever, you, you, whenever it's convenient. He's saying what? Flee. And it's in the imperative mood. Meaning he is commanding them to what? Flee. And he's not commanding them to flee in the future. He's saying you do it when? Yesterday. 
Okay, that's what he's saying. He's saying flee fornication. The English verb flee carries the following meanings according to Webster's Dictionary. To run with rapidity. As far from danger, to attempt to escape, to hasten from danger or expected evil. To depart, to leave, to hasten away, to avoid, to keep at a distance from. When he says flee fornication, he's not saying when you get around to it. When it's convenient. When you don't have a significant other. He's saying do it when? Now. Flee fornication. Now listen. Why would he say to flee fornication? Go back to verse 12. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful unto me, but I will not be brought under the power of what? Why does he say flee fornication? He says to flee fornication because fornication is not expedient and it does not edify you. And not only is it not expedient, and not only does it not edify you, 1 Corinthians 10, 23, not only is that the case, but if you participate in it, it will bring you under its power. And so he says, do what? Get out of there with that. Flee. There's nothing expedient or edifying for a believer in fornication. All, all that the sex is going to do for you folks in an unmarried situation is bring you under its power. It might feel good. You might enjoy it for a time. But it's not going to satisfy you the way that it's designed to in a marriage. And so Paul says to get out of here with that stuff. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 22. He says, flee also youthful, what? Lusts. What are you supposed to do with them? Flee. Go to 1 Thessalonians 4. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1. He says, Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that, it, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk <clears throat> and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. For ye know what commandments we have given you by the Lord Jesus, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification. That you should abstain from what? When I was in Bible college, I had friends that would make long-winded supplication before the Lord that God would reveal His will to them. In the meantime... They're having sex with their girlfriend. You tell me what's wrong with that picture. Did that verse right there tell you what God's will is? What is God's will in this matter? That you abstain from what? Folks, what we're gonna, you know what we're going to see when we get to chapter 7? We're going to see that Paul says that if you cannot contain yourself, you should get what? 
What is God's answer for fornication? God's answer for fornication is for you to get what? Married. And once you are then in that marriage, now do you have a proper, spiritual, nurturing, appropriate way to express that in your life? For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you abstain from fornication. Why? Look at the next verse. That, purpose and the intent. Verse 4. That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and what? And honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. The problem with involving yourself as a believer in fornication is that you are going out and living like all the other Gentiles what? live. And you're acting like there is no what? No difference in your life from having ever been a member of Christ. Not that you could lose that. didn't mean to imply that. Okay, you understand what I'm saying. Concupiscence, it says, verse 5, not, verse five, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. Concupiscence equals lust, unlawful or irregular desire of sexual pleasure. In a more general sense, the coveting of carnal things or an irregular appetite for worldly gain or good. Do you know what you have if you have do you know what you do you know what you have if you have an irregular appetite for worldly gain or good? You know what you have? You have something having power over you. That's what you have. Go back to 1 Corinthians 6, and we'll start wrapping this up. We might be done early today, okay? Might. Verse 18, flee fornication. Now you need to watch the end of this verse close. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. What does that mean? If I lie to you, that's, that's without, that's outside of my what? If I steal something, that's what? Outside my body. If I bear false witness, if I gossip, if I do, you know, he says, every sin that a man doeth is without the body. It, it means it's without, it's, it's where? It's outside, it's out here. Lying, stealing, cheating, blah, 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 right? What's it, how's that verse end though? But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own what? Body. So why should you flee fornication? The way, the, yes, the reason you should avoid fornication, the reason I should avoid fornication, the reason anyone should avoid fornication is because when you fornicate, you are literally sinning against your own body, and that body doesn't belong to you anymore. It belongs to who? It belongs to Christ. So Paul is making a spiritual argument here in the most powerful way possible about what the appropriate and proper and fitting expression of sexual activity is as a human being, as a believer. He's saying, he, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Because when a believer commits fornication, he is sinning against his own body. Go back to, chapter, go back to verse 3. Second half of verse 3. Now the body is not for what? See, how is, it that, how is it that when you commit fornication, you sin against your own body? Verse 13 answers that. He already told you. Because your body is not for what? Fornication. It's for who? It's for the Lord. And the Lord for who? See, now that you're a believer, this body that you've been given is now designed with, is now designed for you to honor God with. That's what it's for. Folks, I look, look, listen, let me just talk to you straight. This is not easy stuff to talk about. It's not easy for you to hear. It's not easy for me to talk about. Okay? There are a host of other passages that I would rather preach on. But the reality is, is that we as a society, we as a culture, we as the members of this assembly face these issues. 
Okay? And we, right here, are, are being told and instructed God's mind. I don't know what all of your histories are. I don't want to know. And notice that I'm not up here telling you mine. But what I do know is this. There's, in the Word of God, there is an appropriate way for somebody to express themselves in a sexual way. And it is within the bonds and the confines of a marriage between a man and a woman. I know that believers that are involved in that are sinning against their own body. But I also know that because they are sinning against their own body, that it is a sin for which Christ what? Died. Should you continue as a believer to sin against your own body? No, you should not. But your stopping that is not contingent upon your justification. It is an issue, though, of your sanctification. Your, your, the practical outworking of your position in Christ. Okay? You young people. Some of them left. You parents that are raising young people. You need to... You need to figure out a balance, and I'm struggling with this right now. You need to figure out a balance between telling your young people the truth about what God made their bodies for and what He created sex for, and giving them the impression that sex is just wrong all the time. If you were like me, I, I grew up in a Christian subculture, okay, and in that Christian subculture, all we heard about was abstinence, 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 right? And rightly so. Does the Bible teach what the appropriate place is for that? Yes, it does, right? But then all of a sudden you get married, and one day they're telling you abstinence, and the next day it's like, really? And so there's conflict, even amongst married people that are believers, over these things. And that's what chapter 7 is about. If you are in the situation where you've been married, and now maybe you're divorced, or you've been in a relationship, and now you're single, can I just encourage you this morning to do things differently the next time? To not make the same mistakes that you made before. To not commit yourself wholly over to another person before you've made a commitment with and to that person before God. And to, 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 to not repeat the same modus operandi over and over and over again and then wonder why it's resulting in the same catastrophe for you. There is forgiveness for all of these things. Okay? And Paul's main point in chapter 6 is for you and I to understand why that type of, why fornication is not conduct becoming a saint of the Most High God. You guys with that? See, sin, I said that the nation, earlier I said that the nation is only as strong as the marriages and families that comprise the nation. Let me say that the, assemb the local assembly is only as strong as the marriages and families that comprise the assembly. And if, if, you're, if, if, if we, you, me, whoever, is going to make a choice to not follow the instruction and sin in that way. What you're doing is you're complicating things in the assembly. Okay? Because I cannot stand up here and in good faith teach to you from the Word of God what God's Word says about these things. And then for things like this to be known within the assembly and for the elders of this assembly to not deal with them. The way Paul lays out for them to be what? 
And let me tell you, all of that can be avoided. All of that can be avoided. And never has to be an issue if you and I, as individual members of the body of Christ, will just make the faith choice to do things right to start with. Wouldn't that be better? Seems to me that it would. So I understand, I don't, I hope, that I am just laboring up here, and maybe very inadequately, to have you understand Paul's heart and mind about this. Not to condemn anybody, not to bring anybody under, you know, the thumb of the oppressive blah, blah, blah. But you need to be aware of the, aware of the fact, folks, that the elders of the assembly are concerned about honoring God with how we run the assembly. And if thing, as things become known to us, we are going to have to try to deal with those things, and we have dealt with those things in the past. We try to do it fairly. We try to do it in accordance with the Word of God. We're humans, and so we don't always make, we might make mistakes sometimes in how we handle that stuff. Okay? But if each of us, I'm going to close with this verse. 1 Thessalonians 4. If we would all individually, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 4. If we would all individually and thereby collectively take this verse to heart, we won't have problems. That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and what? Honor. That's the issue. That's the issue. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word this morning. We do pray that as we have to talk about these difficult subjects, that we'll have clarity from your word and be true to what it says and not interject human viewpoint and opinion, but stick with what the word of God has to say. Knowing that it's true, knowing that it's accurate, and knowing that the way that you laid things out to function is really for our benefit, whether we want to admit it or not. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.